If you uh, don't know much about Dr. Lyle, let me acquaint you with him a little better. He is the Director of Research for the Institute of Creation Research, a group of men that uh, I've had history with since uh, high school when I first went to my, I went to my first Dr. Dwayne Gish debate. And if you've ever seen one of those, you'll never forget them. Dr. Lyle uh, graduated summa cum laude from Ohio Wesleyan University. He double majored in physics and astronomy there, minored in mathematics. In other words, a lot of gray matter up here. Earned a master's degree, PhD in astrophysics at the University of Colorado. He specialized in solar astrophysics. Uh, physics. He has actually made a number of scientific discoveries regarding the solar photosphere, has contributed to the field of general relativity, and since completion of his research at the University of Colorado, he began working in full-time apologetics ministries and specifically focusing on the defense of Genesis. He was instrumental in developing the planetarium at the Creation Museum in Kentucky. If you have not been there, you really need to go. You could spend days there. I had one day with my brother and good friend, saw my sister and visited. It was wonderful. He writes, he directs, uh, and directed the popular planetarian show, including the created Cosmos. He speaks on topics relating to science, the defense of the Christian faith. Uh, we know him here through the videos and DVDs, and it is wonderful to have you here with us, Dr. Lyle. Um, and by the way, did, did you happen to bring some of the books that you've written? You can always Google these, okay? The Ultimate Proof of Creation, Resolving the Origins Debate, Discerning Truth, Exposing Errors in Evolutionary Arguments, the Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, Taking Back Astronomy, The Heavens Declare Creation, Why Genesis Matters, and many articles. In fact, I just this last week read his article in the Acts and Facts magazine on Venus. Fascinating, by the way. So can we welcome Dr. Jason Lyle this morning? Oh, well, it's really good to be with you uh, this morning. And no, we don't have any books. We sold out yesterday of everything So uh, at our, our previous conference. But uh, we do have one book by, Dr., or by uh, Colonel Jeff Williams, an astronaut. And we should have that here. So that's, but, that, but the other ones you'll have to get on the website. I want to talk to you about Your Origins Matter. That's the name of our student ministry at ICR. And it's a, uh, your origins really do matter. It really matters where we, where we came from. Uh, a lot of people have the impression that what well, doesn't really, you know, this creation evolution debate doesn't, it's not all that important. What matters is that we trust in Jesus. Uh, but really, the, the debate does matter. And I want you to consider the United States of America. We have the most churches, most seminaries, most Christian colleges of any nation. Uh, and for all these Christian resources, would you say we're becoming more Christian every day or less Christian every day? Yeah, everywhere I go, people say that. It, feel, it, it, it certainly seems like we're rapidly becoming a pagan nation. And how is it that that can be for all this Christian influence? What's going on here? And I want to suggest that the, there is a connection with origins. You see, all of these issues that we're having in our society, uh, they all stem down really to God's word versus man's word. That's really the bottom line. And that's really what creation versus evolution is all about. God's word, creation, man's word, evolution. And this has been a problem from the beginning. God created Adam and Eve. He told them, if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And effectively, their response was, we're not going to listen to your word. We're going to determine truth for ourselves, you see. And, and, and that's sin. And we're descended from Adam and Eve. We have that same sin nature. We want to determine truth for ourselves. And that's what evolution is. Evolution is man's idea about how life could come about apart from God. And if you believe that, that will have consequences in, in other areas. And I'm going to suggest that the, the root of the decline of Christian America is the attack on God's word beginning in Genesis. If God didn't get the details right in the beginning, then we're in big trouble. When it, you know, we, we, how can we have confidence in anything else that he says? And but by the way, when I talk about evolution, this is what I'm talking about. The idea that single-celled organisms, something like bacteria, eventually, you know, through, through mutations and natural selection, diversified to all the different kinds of organisms that we have on earth today. And of course, I don't believe that. I believe that God created organisms and he built in um, the ability to diversify and so on. Uh, but I don't believe that we're related to an onion. Okay, and that's what my evolutionist friends, they do believe that. I mean, that sounds silly, but that is what they believe. 
If Adam is in your past, if God made you, then he has the right to make the rules. He owns you, and he will hold you accountable for your actions. And so we have a very good reason uh, to behave in a particular way. We're morally obligated to our creator. But if ape is in your past, if you just rearrange, rearrange pond scum, who owns you? Well, you own yourself, right? Who has the right to make the rules? Well, you make your own rules. And so you end up with a relative morality. Um, that is the logical consequence of that way of thinking. Beliefs have consequences. If creation is true, if God made you, if God has the right to make the rules, certain, certain truths stem from that. On the other hand, if evolution is true, if man independent from God determines truth, certain consequences stem from that. If creation is true, well, you'd expect to have laws. Laws, because there's a lawgiver. God has the right to make the rules. You'd expect to have marriage. Marriage is one man and one woman united by God for life. Now, where does that idea come from? Well, it goes back to Genesis. It goes back to the beginning. That's why we have marriage or standards, standards of behavior, standards of clothing. Where does that go back to? That goes back to Genesis as well. Uh, meaning of life. Why is it that human beings have value, intrinsic value, objective value? Why is it that we're different from the animals? I mean, I could, I could go out and kill an animal and eat an animal, and that'd be fine. But if I were to go out and kill a human and eat a human, that would not be fine, would it? There's a difference. We're, why? Well, we're made in the image of God. Animals are not. God cares about animals, but not to the extent that he does those creatures that he's made in his image. And so human life is very special. On the other hand, if evolution is true, why would you have laws? That's what I want to know. If there's no lawgiver, why would you have laws? We can make up laws, but that's arbitrary, right, if there's no creator. I mean, if evolution is all about the strong dominating over the weak, why would you have laws to protect the weak from the strong, which is what laws do? They're anti-evolutionary. Um, why not do what you want with sex, right? Why not, uh, why not abort babies, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids? If we're just animals, why not, right? You see, it really doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense. Now, by the way, I'm not saying that evolution is the cause of all these evils in society. That's not what I'm saying. Sin is the cause of all these evils in society. When people decide they're not going to listen to God's word. But I am suggesting that evolution gives people a way of rationalizing their sin. It really does. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think you're rearranged pawn scum, you're going to have a tendency to act on that belief. And so these behaviors can be justified in the minds of people by a belief in evolution, whereas these standards really stem from Genesis, and they're without a foundation apart from Genesis. And Jesus understood this in his earthly ministry. It's very clear. He quoted from Genesis more than any other book of the Bible. Isn't that interesting? He quoted from it like history, like as if it were a history book. How about that? Which is what it is, of course. In fact, if you read in Matthew 19, when the religious leaders were testing Jesus and they were asking him about divorce, to explain marriage, Jesus went back and quoted Genesis 1 and 2. He understood this principle. He understood that marriage is founded in God's Word. It's founded in Genesis. Now, what's happened in our culture is these evolutionary termites have come in in the minds of people, and they've said, well, you, don't, you can't really trust Genesis because we know from science that millions of years of evolution has happened. And, of course, I will tell you that science does not indicate that millions of years of evolution has happened, but that is what people are told. And they tend to believe that. And so if that's the case, then why would you have laws? And why would you have marriage? I mean, if, if marriage doesn't go back to Genesis, if there really wasn't an Adam and Eve, that's just a myth. And marriage is just a cultural trend. Well, hey, the culture changes. Why shouldn't the definition of marriage change? Huh. Well, that's not a hypothetical issue, is it? That's exactly what we're seeing in our culture today. Our foundations are under attack. And if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? It used to be we had sort of a common foundation, God's Word. Even, even people in this nation who were not Christian tended to have a degree of respect for the, for the Bible because of our Christian heritage. Uh, but, and, and so you could say to people, you know, abortion's wrong, homosexual behavior's wrong, adultery's wrong, and people would say, of course. But there's been a shift in foundation toward man independent from God can determine truth, you see. And so uh, now people say, well, not according to my rules. I've got my standards, and they're different from yours. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, most Christians are standing over there as well. Uh, they embrace the Bible to the extent that it's compatible with the way that they want to live. 
Uh, but, uh, and so you'll find a lot of Christians who will compromise, especially Genesis. They'll say, well, I think, you know, that Genesis isn't really literal history. I mean, it's teaching us certain spiritual truths, but it's not, you know, there wasn't really an Adam and Eve because, you know, hey, that's what most of the scientists say. Well, Genesis really is history. It's written as history. You know those verses you love to read before you go to bed? And so-and-so begets so-and-so, and they begets so-and-so. Those genealogies that you read back in, uh, in Genesis 5, for example. Well, those verses are there for a reason. They're there to tell us that this is real history. These are real people that lived, and it tells us their names, and in many cases the names of their children, sometimes how long they lived, and so on. I understand there are sections of the Bible that are non-literal. That's true. In the Psalms, for example, they're written in a poetic way. Uh, certain prophecies have a lot of symbolism and so on. I understand that. I get that. And there's parables. Jesus spoke in parables, right? Um, and people have said, well, that's just, you know, a parable. Well, not really. It can't be. I mean, it, parables don't, aren't, aren't written this way with, you know, specific names and so on. Usually with parables, usually specific names aren't mentioned or, or rarely. Usually there was a certain man, you know, there was a Samaritan and, or whatever. Um, they certainly don't have lists of genealogies. That would be pointless in a parable. Nor is this poetic literature, like the Psalms. I mean, think about that. This would make a terrible poem, wouldn't it? <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense at all. No, this is written as history. And how do you read a history book? You pick, it, pick up a history book, George Washington rode his horse into battle. You say, well, what does it mean, horse? What does that represent? What does George Washington mean? That means what it says, right? It's history. And Genesis is written as history. And it is, it is significant that these genealogies lead up to Christ. Yes, they do. That's very significant. Uh, and so here's my question then for Christians who compromise and say, well, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I believe he rose from, from the dead. Praise God. I'm glad you do. But then they compromise and say, but I think Adam is just a metaphor. But the Bible says Jesus is descended from Adam. So you're saying Jesus is descended from all those people, descended from a metaphor? That doesn't work, does it? You don't have to know a lot about genetics to know that a real person can't be descended from a metaphorical one. That is not going to be possible. And again, it is really very theologically significant that Christ is descended from a literal Adam. And so are you. Because you see, that makes Jesus our relative. He's our blood relative. You know, that's why his blood can uh, pay for our sins. Because the Bible says we're all of, we're all of one blood. That's theologically important. According to biblical law, only a kinsman can redeem you. Only a relative can save you, you see. And so it was necessary for Christ to become human in order to pay for our sins. That's why animals can't actually take away sins. The Bible says that. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. Now, in the Old Testament, they were used symbolically to point forward to the Messiah. But animals can't take away sins because we're not related to them. Unless, of course, evolution is true. And then that Christian theology is gone, you see. No, it's important we're related to, uh, we're related to Jesus. He is the God-man. I, you know, I, actually at the conference yesterday, I had somebody who got upset with me, and she wrote a letter saying, no, Jesus is not, he's not human, you know, he's, 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 he, because that would make him a sinner. No, no, he is human, and, he, and yet without sin. And that's important, because otherwise we're not related to him, and he can't pay for our sins. So you see, really, the gospel message is connected back to Genesis, that's very important. Putting it another way, which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Is it the first Adam that made it necessary for us to be saved? Or is it Jesus Christ, whom the Bible calls the last Adam, who made it possible for us to be saved? You see, without the first Adam, it makes no sense to have a last Adam. What are we being saved from if you don't understand sin? The gospel is the good news. That's what gospel means. It's the good news. And the good news is that Christ provides salvation from sin. But in order for that good news to make sense, you really have to understand the bad news. The bad news is that man is lost. We need to be saved from our sin. And if you don't explain that to people, it can be very confusing to them. You trust in Jesus, and they say, well, why? I don't think God would keep me out of heaven. I'm basically a good person. You've heard people say that? Yeah. God grades on a curve, doesn't he? I've never gone out and murdered anybody. Well, neither did Adam, right? What was Adam's sin? He went off his diet, right? And that ruined the world. Why? Because it was contrary to what God had told him to do. That's what sin is. And one sin, one sin ruined the world. 
Now, God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And when they're consummated, when they're complete, he said they're going to remain perfect forever, which means not one sin can come into them. Not what even we consider the minor sins, like going off your diet, if, if it's something God told, told you to do, right? And that's a big problem for us because we've all sinned. That's the bad news. Now the good news is Christ has made a way for us to be redeemed. He's paid our sins for us if we will receive it. Now, uh, so I think when we're witnessing to people, we need to say, yes, I do have some good news to share with you, but first the bad news. Let me tell you why you need a Savior. That's the key, you see. The Bible really is the history book of the universe. It starts in the beginning God created, and it tells us the important events that have happened throughout history. People a lot of times want the moral truths that the Bible teaches. Even a lot of times unbelievers will say, yeah, Jesus was a great man. Well, he was, he was but he was much more than that. Uh, you see, people want that spirituality the Bible teaches, but they want to reject the history. But you can't do that because the, the morality the Bible teaches comes out of the history. It really does. Jesus put it like this. He's sp- speaking to uh, Nicodemus, remember that, uh, who came at night, Nick at night, right? Because he was uh, apparently a little bit embarrassed uh, to be out in, in the open. But in any case, Jesus said to him, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? That's a really profound question, isn't it? Yeah, the Bible talks about earthly things. It talks about the days of creation. It talks about Noah's flood. It talks about the confusion of tongues at Babel. And the Bible speaks of heavenly things. It speaks about morality. It speaks about salvation. Now, if you say, yes, I know the Bible talks about you know, the days of creation and this global flood, but I don't think that's really history. I think that's, we need to just interpret that spiritually. I don't think really the details are accurate there. Hey, if God didn't get the details right in earth history, how can we trust that he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? That's what I want to know. People want to be saved and yet reject the history the Bible teaches, but really we can't be saved apart from the history, right? Because our salvation depends on the historical fact that Jesus died and rose again. And that was made necessary because of another historical fact that Adam sinned and rebelled against God. People want to have it both ways. Perhaps to be academically respectable. Oh, I'm a Christian, but I believe in evolution too. When you make those two different versions of history try to agree, guess which one gets modified? Yeah, well, God didn't really mean that he created the organisms. That's just symbolic for evolution. People never do the reverse. They never take Darwin's origin of species and say, well, that's just symbolic for creation in six days. People don't do that, right? And by the way, whichever one of these you modify is not the one that you really have your faith in. You can't modify your ultimate standard because you'd need a greater standard to tell you how to modify it, you see, in which case it's not ultimate. So that reveals what your faith really is in. And of course, I, and I'm not pointing the finger. We all have a tendency to do that. I'm not excluded from that. But I found that tolerance for secular ideas is growing in the church, and so is intolerance for the Word of God. It used to be we used a highlighter to highlight the sections we wanted to memorize, and now Christians are far too inclined to use a blackout marker to black out the sections they don't like. But God never gave us a line item veto on Scripture. He did not. And if you think about it, this was not how Jesus responded in his earthly ministry, right? When people came to him and they had distorted God's word, they had interpreted it in a way contrary to the way the scriptures interpret the scriptures, how did Jesus respond to that? Did he say, well, that's, that's not my belief system, but, you know, we can agree to disagree on that. Let's all be tolerant, right? No, that's not how he responded. Or did he say, well, you know, it's not a salvation issue, so let's not worry about those minor doctrines. Let's just all hold hands and sing kumbaya, right? That's not how he responded. He said, it is written, have you not read? He took people back to the authority of the word. And uh, have you not read? By the way, that's, I believe that's mild sarcasm that Jesus is using because they were the religious leaders. Of course they had read it. That's a little bit of a sarcastic response that Jesus was using to get them to think that they weren't really believing what they'd read. They weren't standing on the authority of the word. Now, Jesus stood on the authority of the word, which I think is interesting because he's God. He could have said, because I'm God and I said so. And that would settle the matter. He could have responded that way. I think it's interesting. He, he used the written word as his authority. Isn't that interesting? He said, it is written. And I think that's an example for us because we can't say, I'm God and I said so. But we can say, God has said in his word. Therefore, it's true. 
There is a culture war going on today between evolution and creation, between secular humanism and Christianity. Those are the two big faith systems today in our, in our nation and to some extent around the world as well, really. Uh, and how are we fighting this battle? Perhaps not as effectively as we could be. We're asleep at the helm, oblivious to the fact that there is a battle going on. We're shooting in the wrong direction entirely, shooting ourselves, shooting our own foundation, representing Christians who say, well, it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis. Boom. You can add millions of years of evolution to the Bible. It won't hurt it. Boom. Well, all, all those Christian doctrines are rooted back in Genesis. All of them are, directly or indirectly. We're popping some balloons. Uh, now, that's okay. It's okay to point out that abortion is wrong and racism is wrong and so on. We can do that. But my point is, if that's all we're doing, we're not really dealing with the problem. We're just shooting at symptoms. Those balloons are symptoms of an underlying problem, a disbelief in the authority of God's word, and um, replacing that with man's word. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, think about it. Christians have spent millions of dollars combating abortion. Has it worked? We still got abortion. Because that stems logically from an evolutionary worldview, you see. Well, what's the solution then? Well, we can keep popping some balloons from time to time. We should do some of that. But we need to do more than that. We need to defend ourselves against these arguments, evolutionary arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we're to cast that down, the Bible says. Uh, we need to do some uh, attacking of our own, pointing out that the evolutionary worldview really isn't all that it's cracked up to be. In fact, really, evolution is a bankrupt scientific conjecture. That's all it is, a bankrupt conjecture. And then we need to repair the damage that's been done to creation and say, hey, we do believe what the Bible says in the beginning. And frankly, when you understand the science, it confirms what the Bible says about the beginning. You can have confidence in God's word from the beginning to the end. You really can. And uh, I like how this is illustrated, too, because you notice we're not aiming at people. The people are not the enemy. The people are the victims. And we want to see them saved. We want to see them jump off of that castle, swim over, and join us on the castle of Christianity. We want people to be saved. We really do. And we're not bashful about that. It's uh, disheartening to me that some, some Christians, I, I understand their motivation, but that some Christians would say, well, we, we can leave the Bible out of the discussion, and we'll just show you that indeed there's a creator. And there, there, there's a movement even that, that uh, focuses on that. Well, the demons believe in God and tremble. It doesn't save them. Believing in God, just believing that God exists is not sufficient for salvation. We want people to be saved. We want them to place their faith in Christ and say, yes, God, I will follow you. I repent of my sins. I want to follow you. And it seems to me if this really is the word of God, we ought to stand on it authoritatively, right? We shouldn't be bashful about that and say, well, yeah, we can just, you know, we can just talk science. Actually, apart from this, science wouldn't make sense. Because science is predicated on the fact that God upholds the universe in a consistent, rational way that the human mind can understand. And God's made our mind, he's made our senses, and so we can probe the universe and learn things. From an evolutionary perspective, there is no reason to believe that science would even be possible. Well, anyway, I think we should stand authoritatively on the word of God. What about the time scale of creation? That's another issue where there's some controversy. There really shouldn't be, but there is. The Bible makes it very clear that God created in six days. It tells us what he did on each of those days of creation. Human beings are made on the sixth day. And from those genealogies you love to read before you go to bed, so-and-so begets so-and-so, you add up those ages and you find that God created a few thousand years ago, something like 6,000 years ago. Maybe you can't get an exact date, but somewhere around there. It's not, it certainly wouldn't be millions or billions of years. And yet, um, I went through the public school system. I was taught that the the uh, earth is 4.5 billion years old and that the universe is even older. 13.8 billion years is the latest number. It was 13.7 uh, a couple years ago and then they added another 100 million years. So time sure flies, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> and you'll find this in the textbooks, right? I mean, there, there's the fossils and you see the fo how far down they are. They say that's millions of years for fossils to form. That's really not the case, but you will see that in the textbooks. Millions of years, there it is. Right? It's got to be true. It's in the books. Well, my point is, if you were stranded on a desert island and all you had was the Bible, I don't think you'd ever conclude millions of years from the Scriptures. That's my point. Uh, the Bible indicates six days, a few thousand years ago is when God created. But people get intimidated, don't they? They think, well, you know, boy, there's a lot of really smart scientists out there that believe in millions of years. 
And I'll concede that. There are a lot of brilliant people who believe in millions of years, but that doesn't make them right. But people get intimidated and they feel like they have to accommodate those millions of years somehow. Got to get them into the scriptures somewhere. Well, where are you going to do it? Where are you going to add the millions of years? You can't do it in between uh, Adam and Christ because that would destroy those genealogies, wouldn't it? I mean, there's, only, there's, there's just only so many people between Adam and Christ. You can't spread that out to millions of years. You can't say so-and-so begets so-and-so, and then a few million years later, they beget so-and-so. That's not going to work. People don't live long enough for that to work. Uh, well, there's only six days before Adam. Adam's made on the sixth day. So people try to get the millions of years into the creation week somehow, because that's the only place they can figure out how to do it. And there's a few different methods they would use. They'd maybe, we'll say maybe the millions of years happens before the beginning, in which case it really wouldn't be the beginning, would it? So that one doesn't really work. Or they'll say maybe there's a gap of time in between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, the so-called gap theory, a few different forms of that. One of the most common today is the idea that, well, God didn't really create in six days, but really six ages. And, uh, you know, then those ages could have been hundreds of millions of years each. So he created over long periods of time, the so-called day-age idea. By the way, um, there is a word that God could have used. There are several Hebrew words that God could have used if he really had meant ages. There are, there are Hebrew words like olam that indicate a long period of time. That's not what he used in Genesis. He used day, the word for day. But people will say, oh, but Dr. Lau, there's scriptural support for this. See, I don't think there is, but they would say, oh, yes, the Bible says, 2 Peter 3, 8, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. See, there you go. Those, those days of creation could have been really long periods of time. And I will say, yes, but what does the rest of the verse say? One day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It cancels that right out, you see. People only take the first part of that verse out of context to try and make time longer, but I've never heard anybody take the second part out of context to try and make time shorter. Have you? Well, the Bible indicates 2,000 years between Abraham and Christ, but a thousand years is as a day. It was really only 48 hours between Abraham and Christ, right? People don't do that, and it'd be silly to. And by the way, this isn't referring to the days of creation anyway. It's horribly out of context to try and take it that way. It's ripping it right out of its context. It's talking about God's patience, why he is, from a human perspective, delaying judgment, because he wants people to be saved. And so what does it mean? One day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. How can those both be true at the same time? Because God is beyond time. God made time. He's beyond it, you see. And so since God is beyond time, whenever he uses time language, it is for our benefit and therefore to be understood on our terms. We can't come up to God's way of thinking, so he comes down to ours. He communicates on a level that we can understand. And by the way, this isn't saying a day is a thousand years. It's saying it's like that to God and a thousand years is a day because he's beyond time. He sees the whole picture beginning to the end. It's a simile comparing two things using like or as. Remember that? It's not giving you permission to change the word day everywhere you see it in Scripture to a thousand years. And even if it were, that wouldn't get you anywhere, right? Because if you change the days of creation to a thousand years each, that would make the earth about 12,000 years old instead of 6,000. It doesn't get you anywhere close to the millions of years that people think they need to add to Scripture. The Hebrew word for day is yom. It's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament of the Bible in singular and plural form. Plural form is yamim. And uh, it's it interesting. The only pe place people question what does day really mean is in Genesis, the, the creation week. That's the only place. Isn't that true? You don't hear people sitting around having Bible studies. How long was Jonah really in the belly of the whale? Were those three ordinary days or were they millions of years? Who can say, right? He might have been in there a long time. And how long did Joshua really take to march around the walls of Jericho? Were those ordinary days or thousands of years? Who can say? We can't tell, right? People just, they don't have a problem with that, do they? They know. If, well, of course those are ordinary days. People say, oh, but the Hebrew word for day, yom, can mean a period of time longer than 24 hours. And that's true. It can in certain contexts. The main meaning for yom is day. How about that? That's what it means most of the time. Almost in all cases. But it can mean a period of time, just like our English word for day can mean a period of time. Back in my father's day, right? You've heard that expression. It's part of a prepositional phrase, and it's similar with Hebrew when it's used as part of a prepositional phrase, like the day of the Lord. So back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. 
You got the word day used three times, and I'll bet you didn't have any trouble understanding what it meant because you used context, used the surrounding words to constrain the meaning. And that's always the case in any language. When words have more than one meaning, you use context to figure out which one is in play in that particular context. Back in my father's day, yeah, that would be a period of time. It took 10 days. Well, those would be ordinary days because it's got a number with it, 10 days, to drive across the Australian outback during the day. That would be the light portion of an ordinary day. It's very clear, really. What about in the Hebrew? Same type of thing. And let's take a look at the Hebrew use of day outside of Genesis 1, where we all agree what it means. We don't have questions about how long Jonah was in the whale. We find, for example, that when the Hebrew word for day, yom, is used with a number, like the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, in an ordered list like that, it is always translated day in every single instance. It doesn't mean time or anything like that. If I said, that, you know, the third day or three days from now, it doesn't mean three periods of time. It means three 24-hour days. It's ordinary days. It happens 410 times outside of Genesis 1. It's very clear. It's an ordinary day. If I had evening and morning together, even if the word day isn't there, what's an evening plus a morning? It's a day, right? You get one half of the day. You get the other half of the day. You add them up. You got a day. That's basic arithmetic. It happens 38 times outside of Genesis 1. We all agree it's an ordinary day. If I had evening with day, that would indicate an ordinary day. The context makes it clear. If I said there was morning that day, um, that would make it clear it's an ordinary day. So evening with day or morning with day, and that happens 23 times each outside of Genesis 1, it's very clearly an ordinary day. If I said there was day, then there was night. Day following night or night following day, you know I'm talking about an ordinary day and an ordinary night for that matter. They, con they constrain each other. Again, in Hebrew, that's the way it is. And that happens 50-some uh, times outside of uh, Genesis 1. We all agree it's an ordinary day. Well, let's apply these contextual clues to Genesis 1 and see if we can figure out what God meant when he said day, when he said that he made things in six days. Genesis 1, verse 5, and God called the light day. So there he's defining it for you. Day is when it's light out. Well, that would be an ordinary day, right? It wouldn't be a long period of time. And he called the darkness, he called night. So you got night associated with day. That would have to be an ordinary day. They're contrasted against each other. And the evening associated with day, going to be an ordinary day. And the morning associated with day, going to be an ordinary day. You got evening and morning together, that's going to be an ordinary day. And you got a number with it first. Or one day, got to be an ordinary day. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Well, what about the other days of creation? Let's take a look. Evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day. That's pretty clear, isn't it? It's kind of like God's trying to say, see, they're ordinary days, and in case you still don't get it, they're ordinary days, in case you're a little thick, they're ordinary days, in case you're really intellectually challenged, they're ordinary days. <laughs> it's pretty clear, really. Any one of those clues would have been sufficient to constrain the meaning to an ordinary day. God uses all of them. Like he's pretty serious about, you know, these really were ordinary days. And by the way, I really mean literal days. <laughs> he's going out of his way to make that clear. Now, some people will say, well, they can't be ordinary days because the sun wasn't made until the fourth day. Well, that doesn't really make any sense from an astronomy perspective because the sun really doesn't have much to do with the length of the day. It's primarily the rotation of the earth that causes us to have 24-hour days, you see. The sun just provides a, a point of reference that the earth rotates under, you see. So as long as you have light and a rotating planet, you'll have day and night. Did we have light on the first day? And God said, let there be light, and there was light, yeah. God provided the temporary light source for those first three days. He doesn't tell us what it was. You can speculate if you like, I've heard everything. I'm not gonna speculate, because the Bible doesn't say. But uh, did we have a rotating planet on the first day? Well, yeah, because we had evening and morning. It was already rotating when God made it. So, of course, you're going to have day and night. And then God replaces that temporary light source with the sun on the fourth day. Um, I think perhaps that was done to displace the sun um, so that the Hebrews would be less inclined to worship it. And many ancient cultures worshiped the sun as the ultimate source of life. But he pushes it off to day four. It's not the ultimate source of life. God is the ultimate source of life, you see. Uh, the sun certainly provides energy for us, but it's not the primary thing. And so he displaces it a few days. He doesn't even call it the sun and the moon in Genesis 1. We, we learn later that that's what it is. But um, I think that by not giving it a proper name, it's, these aren't deities that God made. They're just objects that God made. You see, the greater light and the lesser light. Well, here the boy says, six days. And the girl says, yep. Six truly, really days? Yep. You're sure it says six days? Yes. 
I wonder why it took so long. That's the question we should be asking because if you think about it, God had the power to create the universe in an instant, just like that. It wouldn't have been a problem for him at all. He's God. He's infinite. He really had to slow himself down to create in six days. And then he rested a day. Why did he do that? Does God get tired? Does he need to rest? No. But we do, and God knew that. And he made that way and rested a day as a pattern for us. That's where we get the idea of a week. You realize that? All the other units of time have a basis in astronomy. Uh, the uh, day is a rotation of Earth on its axis. A month is the amount of time it takes the moon to go around or the Earth and to go through all of its phases. A year is the amount of time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. Where do we get the idea of seven days in a week? That's how long it took for God to create and rest. There's no astronomical basis for it. And the fact that uh, almost all cultures on Earth have a seven-day week is an indication that they all knew Genesis at one point, all of them. We're all descended from Adam and Eve. We're all descended from Noah, for that matter. They knew about creation. Back in Martin Luther's time, there were some people who were trying to squeeze the days of creation into one day, saying God really made everything in one day for various philosophical reasons, not, not biblical ones, obviously. And I want to show you how Martin Luther responded to this. It's a great quote. He says, How long did the work of creation take? When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. I love this last part. He says, but if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> Isn't that good? That's a great quote. That's very bold. What about the gap theory then? People say, well, yeah, the days were ordinary days, but maybe we can stick millions of years in between two of them. Maybe we can get a gap of time in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And they would put, uh, they'd say that's where all the millions of years happens. That's where the dinosaurs were, and that's where Lucifer fell and everything. Well, you won't get scriptural support for that, folks. They'd like to say, verse 2, the earth, they'd like to translate it, and the earth became without form. You see, they'd like to say, you know, that God made the heavens and the earth and it was perfect, and then millions of years later it became without form. Well, you really can't translate it that way in that context. The Hebrew word doesn't, can't really be rendered that way in that context. And people will say, oh, but doesn't the King James Bible, doesn't God tell Adam and Eve to go and replenish the earth, right? Doesn't that mean that it was full and then there was some kind of disaster and they had to go and refill it? Isn't that what replenish means, refill? Well, maybe today, but not when the King James was translated. The Hebrew word that's translated replenish just means to fill up completely. It doesn't mean to do it again. It just means to do it completely or thoroughly. The prefix re can mean to do something again or can mean to do something thoroughly, like research, to search thoroughly. Uh, replenish, it's not an error in the King James. It's just that's what the word meant at the time. Replenish meant to, com to fill completely, to, com to fill thoroughly. But in fact, you can't put a gap of time in between verse 1 and verse 2 because of the way it's constructed in the Hebrew. See, and this is Hebrew. Hebrew reads right to left. And so, uh, see there? In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. That's it. That's what it says. So the Hebrew scholars tell me. I can't read Hebrew either, but that's what they tell me. Verse, uh, verse 2, and the earth. Whenever you have that in Hebrew, and followed by a noun, and the earth was without form and void. That's what's called a vav disjunctive. Vav is the Hebrew word and letter for and. And uh, so vav disjunctive. And, and that's kind of like what we use parentheses for in English. It indicates that that verse is a comment on the previous one, basically. Okay? Uh, now the rest of Genesis is, is different. It's vav consecutive, and that does follow in time. And that's when you have and followed by a verb. And said God is the way it's worded in, in Hebrew. Now, in English, it's and God said. But in Hebrew, it's and said God. And followed by a verb. And that is chronological. That means it follows in progressive um, order. And all of Genesis 1 is vav consecutive except verse 2. Verse 2 is vav disjunctive. And my point is you cannot put a gap of time in between verse 1 and verse 2 because verse 2 does not follow in time. Verse 2 is a description of verse 1. Okay? It's like, again, it's like what we'd use parentheses for in English. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, parentheses, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and so on. He's describing the conditions of the earth when it was first created. So the gap theory has been very thoroughly refuted just because of the Hebrew grammar. What about the scientific evidence? You know, there's abundant scientific evidence that the world is thousands of years old. You tend not to hear that in the public schools because... If the world's thousands of years old, then evolution is out the window, isn't it? But there's plenty. I'll give you just a little teaser here. I do whole talks on this. Uh, carbon-14. Carbon, most carbon is carbon-12. 
and, but C14, you've heard of C14, that has two extra neutrons in it, and C14 is unstable, which means it decays, it changes spontaneously into nitrogen uh, over a period of a few thousand years, okay? And so we've actually found C14 in diamonds. Now C14, again, doesn't last very long. It lasts thousands of years, sure, but it doesn't last millions of years. In fact, if the entire Earth were nothing but C14, after one million years, you would not have one atom of it left. That's how fast it decays, okay? It can't last millions of years, let alone billions. And yet we find C14 in diamonds that secularists believe to be one to two billion years old based on other radiometric dating techniques, you know, uranium, lead, potassium, argon, and so on. Um, but they can't be that old because the C14 is still there. They say, well, how, somehow it must have got new, C, new C14 in there recently. How? It's a diamond. It's the hardest substance. How are you going to get new C14 in there? It's, that doesn't make any sense. In fact, uh, fossils, you know, a lot of times um, people think carbon dating gives millions of years. It does not. Carbon dating is our friend. You can take uh, fossils, if they have enough carbon left in them, fossils are permineralized. Rocks have come and replaced the, all the holes in the bones. But sometimes there's, there's still fresh material left in the fossils. And we've, um, in fact, we've, we've sent in at ICR, we've taken some dinosaur fossils and sent them in to have car carbon dating. We didn't tell them they were dinosaur fossils. We sent them into secular labs and said, Car please carbon date this for us and find out if there's any C14 left in them. You know, they all had C14 in them, all of them. That which, which age dates them to a few thousand years. Dinosaurs aren't millions of years old. They're recent. Isn't that interesting? You tend not to hear about that in the secular media because it blows their worldview. Well, bottom line is the secular scientists say the earth is billions of years old. Take my word for it. God says I created in six days. Take my word for it. God's word versus man's word. That's really what it comes down to. Well, my next question is, does it matter? Because historically, the secularists came along and said, the Bible is not true. These rock layers prove the earth is much older than you think. And a lot of the theologians, not all of them, but a lot of them compromised and said, well, maybe we can accommodate the millions of years. After all, it's not a salvation issue, right? In the sense that, you know, the Bible doesn't make six, believing in six days a requirement for salvation. It makes faith in Christ a requirement for salvation, yes? We're saved by God's grace, and that's received through faith in Christ, not you know, believing in six days. I don't want to add to the gospel. Nonetheless, I would say this is an important issue, right? It's kind of like gravity. Gravity is not a salvation issue. You can disbelieve in gravity and still go to heaven. In fact, you'll probably get there much faster that way, right? Yeah. But gravity is an important issue, and so is the issue of six days. It's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's important because it's what God has said in his word. We're not to treat God's word like a buffet where we just sort of pick and choose what we, what we want to accept. It's all God's word. In fact, the section of scripture where it says, in six days, the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, that's written as part of the Ten Commandments. That was written by the finger of God in stone. <laughs> you better take that seriously. We need to take all the Bible seriously. It's all inspired by God. I just think it's interesting. God wrote that part himself without using, normally he uses people to write his, his word. He wrote that himself. Isn't that interesting? After all, the same Bible that teaches six days also teaches virgin birth. Jesus turned water into wine, walked on water, calmed the storm, raised the dead, raised himself from the dead. If you say, yes, I know the Bible teaches six days, but hey, most of the scientists, they say that's nonsense. They believe the world's billions of years old. So I'm going to reinterpret that. I think that's just symbolic. God really made every millions of years. It doesn't really mean what it says. Well, guess what? Most scientists don't believe in a virgin birth, turning water into wine, walking on water, calming the storm, raising the dead. They don't believe that's possible. You'd have to reject that too to be logically consistent. You'd have to say, well, I'm just going to spiritualize that. Jesus didn't literally rise from the dead. And that is a salvation issue. You say, oh, I, but I, no, I, I believe in those portions. But you see, it's the same hermeneutic. Are you going to allow man's understanding of the universe to reinterpret God's holy word? And if you're going to do it in Genesis, why not elsewhere? Some people say, oh, but no, the, those were miracles, you see. You know, the virgin birth and the turning the water into wine, that, those were miraculous. Wasn't creation? If you think it's not, let's see you do it. Okay. There's another reason why we don't want to add in the millions of years, and that concerns these fossils that we find all over the earth. And we do find fossils everywhere. By the way, I think that's naturally what you'd expect given a worldwide flood, isn't it? Worldwide flood would bury organisms, and it wouldn't take long. It would kill them, bury them in rock layers, because the, you know, all the mud would come in and bury them, and it turns into rock. It doesn't take millions of years, by the way, for mud to turn to rock. Uh, I've seen a, I've got a picture somewhere of a set of car keys embedded inside solid rock. I don't think that took millions of years. Anyway, 
My point here is that you have a theological problem if you hold up a fossil and say, I think this is 100 million years old. Because a fossil is a dead thing. And if you got death 100 million years ago, you've got death before Adam sinned. In fact, you've got death before Adam existed because we all agree that human beings don't go back hundreds of millions of years. Even evolutionists will concede that. Humans go back thousands of years. But doesn't the Bible say that death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin? By man came sin and, and death? Hmm. But according to evolution millions of years, by death came man. Now those two positions are logically contrary to each other. They cannot both be true. Either by death came man or by man came death. And if death is not the result of Adam's sin, if it's not the penalty for sin, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? You see, the gospel is undermined if you allow death before sin. Here we have the Garden of Eden, Eve saying, oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world. Adam saying, yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said. Remember, the Bible says God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. It wasn't just the Garden of Eden, by the way. God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good, exceedingly good in Hebrew. But if the fossils were already there, and creatures have already been suffering and dying and killing each other for millions of years. And then God makes the Garden of Eden on top of that. You've got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of millions of years of deaths, struggling disease, pain, bloodshed, whatever. You know, we find fossils with evidence of disease in them, things like cancer, arthritis, and so on. There's a whole field called paleopathology that studies disease in fossils. Now, was that already in the world? Were those diseases already there before Adam sinned? But God saw everything he'd made, and behold, it was very good. Do you think the world was already full of death and suffering? You have to believe that if you believe in millions of years. If you think the fossils are millions of years old, the world was already full of death and suffering, God looked at it and said, that's very good. In which case, God's definition of very good really isn't very good, is it? Not at all. Now, some people have said, oh, well, Dr. Lyle, it's just, it's just human death that Adam introduced. Animals were already dying and so on. I don't think you can defend that scripturally. Not at all. God cares about animals too, by the way. Not to the same extent he does us, but he cares about animals. Uh, not even a sparrow falls without your father noticing, right? Um, and if you think about it, God instituted animal death when Adam and Eve sinned, didn't he? Because the Bible says he provided skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. Those would be animal skins. So God sacrificed an animal or animals to provide skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. I think that was a picture of the gospel, you see. It sort of symbolized Christ, who would, who would be the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Uh, this provided the temporary covering for them. Christ would actually be a permanent covering. So, yeah, even animal death was introduced at the time of the fall. Now, some people would say, oh, but Dr. Lyle, you at least had plant death before sin, right? Because we know Adam and Eve were eating plants and plant parts and so on. Well, yes and no. Yes, you did. Yes, they were eating plants and so on. But plants can't literally die because, you know, biblically, plants aren't literally alive. Did you know that? The Bible uses a special word, nephesh, is the Hebrew word nephesh kaya, means living creatures. That applies to human beings. It applies to animals. It's, it never is applied to plants. Now, modern biologists use a slightly different definition of life, and they include plants in that, but the Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't classify plants as living things. The Bible classifies plants as food for living things, okay? And so there's no problem eating plants and stuff like that. That's not literally death because they're not literally alive to begin with. Now, you can certainly talk about a dead tree. You can talk about a dead battery, but that doesn't mean it was ever really alive. You see what I'm saying? And we sort of know that, right? You know, plants are in a different category. You can come across a so-called dead tree in the woods. Well, that's nice. I think I'll sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it, put it over my mantle, right? But if you come across a dead animal in the woods, you say, well, that's nice. I think I'm going to sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it, put it over my mantle. That's different, isn't it? I mean, I could imagine that in the eternal state. I could imagine that in heaven, right? But not that. We, I mean, we recognize that that's an intrusion into a world that was once perfect. And the Bible makes that very clear. The world was perfect originally. We ruined it by rebelling against God. That's where the death and suffering of animals and human beings, that's where it comes in. Plants don't suffer. They're not, they're not conscious anyway. But, um, and then the world will be made perfect as a result of Christ's obedience. And we can be part of that only by receiving him as our, as our Lord and Savior. Uh, I'm going to skip a few of these for time's sake. But really, six days versus millions of years is the same issue as creation versus evolution. It's God's word versus man's word. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of science that confirms creation. There's a lot of science that confirms thousands of years. 
And I kind of specialize in that. But bottom line is, it's what God said in his word. That's what makes it right, you see. Truth lines up perfectly with, what, with God's thoughts. Truth is God's thoughts, you see. There are lots of other problems you have if you compromise with the millions of years. Thorns and thistles. You know, we find thorns deep down in fossil layers that evolutionists believe to be 400 million years old. Now, if that's true, then when God cursed the earth and said, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, Adam could have said, so what? Thorns have been around for millions of years. You see, it would make no sense, would it? People think they can just pull away the six days and the scriptures will be unaffected, but the Bible all hangs together or it all falls apart. What about the extent of the flood? You know, you can't consistently believe in millions of years and a worldwide flood because either the fossils were deposited gradually over millions of years or they were deposited catastrophically during the worldwide flood. You can't have both because a worldwide flood would destroy a previous fossil record anyway due to all the, you know, the tectonic activity and so on. Floods are devastating. Even local floods that we have are devastating. Imagine a worldwide flood. Therefore, Christians who reject six days of creation and believe in millions of years, um, they, they tend to reject a worldwide flood as well. I'm thinking of, of a particular um, a Christian leader, he goes around teaching that you should believe in the Big Bang and you should believe in millions of years and, and you know, God used that to create. And he doesn't believe in a worldwide flood. He, you know, he'll say he does, but he, you ask him, do you believe that water literally covered the globe? He'll say no. And he says that there was, a, there was a flood, sure. There was a flood of Noah, but it was just a local event limited to the Mesopotamia Valley. Well, what does the Bible have to say? Anytime you hear something like that, it doesn't sound quite scriptural. Go back to the Bible, double check, because sometimes, sometimes we read it wrong. That's, it's, it never hurts to go back and double check. What does the Bible say about the extent of the flood? Let's take a look. Genesis six seventeen. God says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy, what, a few things here and there? No, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from, what, the local Mesopotamia Valley? No, no, from under heaven. That would be under the sky. That would be the whole globe, wouldn't it? And everything that is in the earth shall die, the text says. Verse 19 in chapter 7, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail. The mountains were covered. Is that a local flood? I don't think so. And all flesh died, every creeping thing, every man, all in whose nostrils was of the breath of life. All that was in the dry land died. Every living substance was destroyed. Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. It's very clear that's a global flood, isn't it? <laughs> Scripture hammers that home as much as it does the, you know, the evening, morning, number day in, in Genesis 1. By the way, you can't have a local flood that covers the high hills. Think about that. What would that look like? It would look like this, right? <laughs> it's not going to work. Water seeks its own level. What about the purpose of the rainbow? Wasn't that God's promise never to send another global flood? But if it was just a local flood and God was promising never to send another local flood, then God has broken his promise thousands of times because we do have local floods. I lived in Colorado for a number of years and where I lived, it's kind of gone now. I mean, it's, there was a massive flooding there. It's incredible. What about the ark? Why would you spend all the, that time and energy and resources building an ark the size of an ocean liner for a local flood. Take two of every air-breathing land animal on earth for a local flood that you knew was coming. Why not just move? Right? <laughs> I think it would take a, a bit less effort. Well, the Bible indicates that people would deny that worldwide flood in the last days. It says, For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens revolved and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded by water. Well, I'm going to sum it up with this cross series, and then maybe we'll take some questions if you like. Uh, come to Jesus, come to the cross, and be saved. That's what, the ter- that's what the church is preaching. We should be preaching that. That's important. That's the right message. That's the gospel. But there's been an attack in the form of millions of years. It's one of the attacks. It's not the only attack on Scripture, but it is a significant one. And that impacts, you know what we're inclined to think? Hey, didn't hit the cross. Don't have to worry about that. Not a salvation issue. But millions of years is an attack on Genesis. And Genesis is the foundation of the gospel. It's because of what Adam did that we need a savior. But if millions of years is true, you can't trust Genesis 1, Genesis 1 through 11. We think it didn't hit the cross. Secular humanists 
um, if they were aiming at the cross, if they're saying, oh, Jesus never existed, or he existed, but he never, he never rose again. Well, you can get books to defend the resurrection. We're concerned about that. Satan's crafty, though. He's aiming at our foundation. And we think, well, it's just a side issue. No, it's a foundational issue. It's an issue of biblical authority. That's what it comes down to. So then all these different attacks came. Age dating methods, evolution, eight men, millions of years, no global flood. And they impact. And we think, well, it didn't hit the cross, but really it was a direct hit. Our foundations are under attack. And what is the result of all these different attacks on Genesis? The result is unbelief. If I have told you of earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? The cross stems out of the history that the Bible teaches in Genesis. And these different symptoms happen. Well, hey, prayer has been outlawed in schools. We say, well, uh, trust in Jesus. We should trust in Jesus. But we're not dealing with the problem. Creation outlawed in schools. Jesus is going to return. Yes, he is. But until then, he's commanded us to do some things, like to defend the faith, to make disciples of all nations. The Bible outlawed in schools. You say, well, hey, oh, we need to get the Bible back into schools. Uh, not that that's wrong, but that's not the way that the nation will be led to God. It really isn't. Um, we need to defend the Christian faith. That's the way it will be led back to God, preach the gospel. Ten Commandments outlawed in schools. We say, hey, let's just concentrate on worship. Now, again, these are, it, it, these are good things. Worshiping God, that's a good thing. But my point is we're not dealing with the root of the problem, are we? And the, the gospel has become obscured by unbelief. People no longer have confidence in the word of God, because we haven't really defended it as we should, it, particularly in Genesis. They think that, well, science has disproved Genesis. Well, that's why we exist at ICR. We want to come alongside the church. We're not a church. We want to come alongside the church uh, as, a, as a ministry. Of course, all of us at ICR, we, we're members of our local churches and so on. We want to repair the damage that's been done to Genesis. You can trust in Genesis. It's, it's true, and the science confirms it when you understand that science. We want to warn you when these different attacks come. Yes, these are attacks on the Christian faith, and then we show you how to refute those various arguments, you see. And that's why we produce the resources that we have uh, that I'll, I'll mention just here, here in just a minute. And then ultimately, we'd like to be in the background. We'd like everyone in the church to be able to defend the Christian faith, you see, against all these different attacks. And then the church can say, come to the Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And people will say, oh, it makes sense, now I get it. It's what Adam did. And I can trust that God, his word is right. And Adam was a real person. And because of that, I need a savior. I have a sin nature because I'm, descended, I'm a sinner descended from sinners. That's, what, that's why I need Christ. Well, let me just show you a few of the resources. We don't have these here because, again, we sold out uh, yesterday at the conference. And uh, it, was a really, it was a good conference, though. We were really blessed by the, the people there. But we do have these resources. You can get these on our website, icr.org, like Creation Basics and Beyond, as well as my book, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. It's going to show you how to think through these issues and really defend the Christian faith effectively. Uh, discerning truth, how to spot errors in reasoning, logical fallacies. Uh, created Cosmos, we have DVDs. This will, take you, this will fly you through the universe from a biblical perspective. It's really neat. It's, it's the planetarium show that I wrote for the Creation Museum. A um, number of others as well, and since we don't have these here, I won't spend too much time on them. Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, my book on how to enjoy the night sky better. Taking Back Astronomy, how to look at the universe from a biblical perspective. One thing you can do here, we do have a sign-up sheet for Acts and Facts magazine. How many of you are already getting Acts and Facts magazine? Okay. Uh, I'd encourage the rest of you to sign up for this. It's, it is a, it's a fantastic magazine, and it is totally free, and we're able to do that. There's no catch. We're able to do that because of our generous donors, and so we'd encourage, we just want to bless you. So please sign up for that, and we'll be happy to send that to you, monthly uh, magazine. Um, check us out on the web, icr.org, as well as our student ministry, youroriginsmatter.com. That's a great place to send students so that they can, they can ask questions and stuff. I have a blog as well that you might want to look at, and I interact with evolutionists on there. So you can uh, take a look at that. So we can uh, do some Q&A? Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, what I would like to do, folks, for the sake of uh, the video and so everyone else can hear you, if you raise a hand, I will bring you the microphone. You can ask Dr. Lyle. Everyone else will know what you're asking, and we'll get to hear both the question and the answer that way. So who would like to ask a question? Make me work. Here we go. Um, last year, last year we had a speaker come to our church that wrote a book called Why God? And I started to read that book and 
uh, one of the things I noticed was it sounded like they supported evolution. So I, I took that to my pastor and he actually, I guess, didn't pick up on that on the book. So he did, he went and talked to the publisher and they were going to rewrite that section of the book because it, it, it kind of led people to believing evolution. Mm -hmm. There was another section in that book that talked about the Big Bang Theory and how that doesn't necessarily disprove evolution. And you kind of mentioned that in what you were talking about. So could you expand on that a little bit? Because it was kind of leaving it open to that the Big Bang Theory does not disprove evolution and that it, it was kind of supporting creation. Yeah, the uh, the Big Bang really is the it really is the secular alternative to creation. It really is. It's the idea that the universe kind of popped into existence uh, 13 billion years ago, and it, along with that, everything uh, like stars and galaxies, those things are supposed to have formed naturally through the laws of nature as gas collapses in on itself and so on. We've never seen any of this, by the way. There's no. I don't believe there's any scientific support for that. Um, the Bible indicates God made the stars, so that was a supernatural act of God. Uh, the Big Bang, uh, one, one point I really want to hammer home, the Big Bang cannot be reconciled with Scripture. If the Bible's true, the Big Bang isn't, and vice versa. Because the Big Bang teaches billions of years, the Bible teaches thousands of years. The order of events is wrong, even if you made the days of creation long periods. Um, the Big Bang teaches, for example, that stars came billions of years before the Earth, but the Bible indicates that Earth's made before the stars. Earth's made on day one, stars are made on day four. So for the order is different. Uh, the the uh, Big Bang and naturalistic story indicates that fish evolved before fruit trees. The Bible indicates God created fruit trees on day three, fish are made on day five. So even the order of events is different. So the Big Bang cannot be reconciled with Scripture. The Big Bang and evolution go together very well. Although it's true that there are some people who would reject one and embrace the other, most people, most secularists accept the Big Bang and evolution. They go well together because they're both really secular ideas. Uh, there's a, the, one of the um, uh, one of the people that I mentioned, this person who denies the worldwide flood. Uh, he believes in the Big Bang, and that's what motivates him to reject the worldwide flood because he embraces the the millions of years. Uh, some people, for some strange reason, have thought that the Big Bang is an argument for God because it at least indicates the universe has a beginning. But you should know that the latest versions of the Big Bang don't don't teach that. The latest the latest ideas about the Big Bang is that it's that we live in a multiverse and our universe popped into existence from another one. And so it doesn't lead you to the God to God. And even if it did lead you to a God, it doesn't lead you to the biblical God because the biblical God indicates he did things differently than what the Big Bang teaches. Dr. Lyle. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. Uh, who would like a okay, I see that hand. David Phillips. Uh, you want to get that one, Greg? Someone working? We've got another mic too. Yeah, thanks Dr. Lyle for coming. Uh, I have two questions if I may. Uh, the first one, uh, would you talk a, a little bit about your views on Hubble's constant? Uh, in other words, it seems against the laws of physics that the farthest stars are supposedly accelerating the fastest and how would that fit within your model of creation? Uh, number two, uh, would you please consider writing an advanced book on astronomy from a creationist perspective? You know, maybe you and Danny Faulkner or some others could get together. That's what we need desperately. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Sure. Regarding the first question, Hubble's constant uh, describes the um, the rate at which the universe is expanding. I think the universe is expanding. I think that's scriptural in uh, sections like uh, Isaiah 40:22, where it talks about God stretching out the heavens. And uh, as a result of that, when we look out to these galaxies, the, the farther away a galaxy is, its light is what we call redshifted. Now that doesn't mean the galaxy looks red. What it does mean is that when you, when you take the light from a galaxy and you break it down into a rainbow, or you break it down into a spectrum, there'll be these little black lines in it. And that's like an atomic fingerprint. It tells you what the substance that made the light is. It's really amazing. That's how, that's how we know what stars are made of, by the way, is, is the spectroscopy, breaking that light into a spectrum. Redshifted means that those little black lines shift from where they are on Earth toward the red end of the spectrum. 
Okay, so you can't just tell by looking at it that it's that it's red shifted. But when we measure it, it indicates that it's um, those, the wavelengths have been shifted toward the longer end. And we think the reason for that is because the light has traveled from that galaxy to here and it's been stretched out with the universe. So as the universe has expanded, the light beams have been stretched out. Longer uh, wavelengths means it shifts toward the red. Now it happens that um, galaxies that are farther away are more red shifted. And that suggests that's because the space, there's more space in between them and the space has been stretched even more. So basically the Hubble, the Hubble law, is what's called the Hubble law, the fact that farther galaxies are more red shifted, what that suggests is that all galaxies basically are moving away from all other galaxies. It's kind of like if I were to put points on a balloon, a bunch of dots on a balloon, and then blow up the balloon, every dot would move away from every other dot. Does that make sense? And so our galaxy represents one of those dots. We see every, every other galaxy moving away from us, not because our dot's in a special position, but because it's like a balloon. The, the two-dimensional surface of that balloon is like the three dimensions of our universe. So we're, we're missing one dimension, but you get the idea that every, everything moves away from everything else. Uh, so I don't have any problem with that. I think that's suggested in scripture. People have said, well, does that mean it exploded into existence billions of years ago? So you run it back in time, it comes from a point no, right? Because some of you are expanding a bit. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence billions of years ago. Uh, it just means that you're bigger than you used to be. And likewise, God, I think, made the universe with some size, and he stretched it out since then, and the Hubble law would seem to be consistent with that. Uh, regarding your second question, I'd love to write a more technical book on astronomy. There are very few creation astronomers out there. It, it's, it's difficult because um, in the secular world, when you write on an advanced technical topic, I mean, first of all, it's harder to do that, right? Because you have to go, you know, go, go into all the math and everything, and it takes some time and effort. In the secular world, you can get colleagues to help you. In the creation world, there are very few. Um, there are about six or seven creation astronomers out there that are, you know, have a PhD in the field and really um, are interested in contributing to the creation model. But I'd love to do that at some point. The best we have right now, there are two books. They're called Design and Origins in Astronomy. And there's volume one and volume two. And those are a little more technical than most of the other books that I've written. They go into a little more detail. So you, you might look into that. I, I'm not sure if we stock them on our website, but you, you can find them elsewhere. Design and Origins in Astronomy, Volume 1 and 2. Volume 2 is particularly good. I'm really impressed with that one. Told that we were told that we were all out of the materials from ICR, but George uh, Huskin, are you here? George, were you able to bring some materials? No, okay. So. Boy, a couple years back we had the entire lobby filled with books. Sorry we don't today. Okay, why don't we move over here. Greg, you want to just come on down here, and then Tim, I'll take yours after that. Just a reminder, too, you can get any of the books that I mentioned on the website, icr.org. And that, that itself is a great, great resource. Thousands of articles on that, and that's free. I had a question about starlight. Mm -hmm. I actually heard your explanation of that yesterday, but I need a bit more simplified answer to um, how to defend that some stars are six billion light years away. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we talk about that? How do we, like to an eight-year-old? <laughs> yeah, um, it's, uh, some stars are very far away. The universe is really big. I don't have any doubt about that. The methods by which we establish those distances are good scientific methods. They're not based on evolutionary assumptions or anything like that. The question is, how do you get, this, how do you get the light from there to here in 6,000 years? And the, the short answer is, the, um, even though we know the speed of light on a round trip, the one-way speed can actually be instantaneous. What I mean by that is if I take a beam of light and bounce it off a mirror and bring it back, it'll take some time. You know, if I had a long hallway, an example I used yesterday was a hallway that's 186,000 miles long, and I have a mirror at the other end. If I shine a beam of light down and bring it back, it will take two seconds to make that trip. Most people assume that it takes one second to go out and one second to come back, but in fact, physics allows for it to go down. It could take all two seconds to go down, and zip back instantaneously. And uh, Einstein allowed for that, physics allows for that, and I think that's the convention that the Bible's using. So basically, if, if the Bible's using this convention that I think it is, light takes no time at all to get from those galaxies to here. And the reason that most secular astronomers assume otherwise is because they're assuming that the one-way speed is the same as the round-trip speed, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and that's, I think that's as simplified as I can make it. Some things are just hard. And it's like, you know, I want, I, want to, I want all my groceries in one bag, but I don't want the bag to be heavy. And, uh, you know, it's, some, sometimes you can't accomplish that. You know, some things like quantum mechanics that it just, it's just kind of hard. God's constructed the universe that way. But I do think we have a good answer. And um, I have written some articles on that. Creation Basics and Beyond book has a chapter 
on that, and that might help some men at home too. Sometimes when you hear something and then you read it later, it really, it really brings it together. Excellent. Tim? Oh, that was the same question. Excellent. Okay. Uh, real quick, do you, um, could you give us a few of your thoughts on, on maturity of things during each day of creation? That idea that yeah. you don't need years, you just need maturity. It's true. Yeah, God made the universe functional. Um, some people say with appearance of age, but I reject that wording because age technically doesn't have appearance, right? Appearance is something you can see. You can't see age. We use that term informally with people. You say they, they look a certain age, but that's because um, people age at a particular rate, and even that's approximate because people do age at different rates, really. Um, but God did make the universe mature. He made it functional. The first trees, apparently, they didn't take any time to be trees. I don't know if they had rings. I kind of suspect they do have rings. But that doesn't indicate their age, not for the first trees, right? They, or, even if they didn't have rings, they would have had thickness. Now, today, it takes a tree to, some time to grow to a thir certain thickness. But the trees that God made, no time at all, right? Adam was made as an adult, not as a baby. And people say, well, that's deceptive of God. No, it isn't. It's what he told us he did. And um, yeah, he had to start somewhere. He could have started with a baby, but then that, he'd need somebody to care for the child and so on. And, and he'd say, well, there, he's deceptive there because he didn't have a mother. You know? So you can't get away from that. God had to start the system in some state. And it's always possible to imagine a previous state that would have led up, left, that would have led up to that state. But that doesn't make God deceptive. That's, that's our problem. If we were to assume that Adam came about by the same processes, the natural processes that people come about today, we would misestimate his age. And we would overestimate it enormously, wouldn't we? We would say, well, I, I guess he's probably about 30 years old. But my point is, if you asked Adam on the day he's made, how old do you think you look? I don't think he'd say 30 years. He'd say, well, apparently this is what a one-day-old looks like. You see, it's not until much later he would learn that he and Eve were made in a different way than, than God has chosen to make other people. You see, they're, they're unique. And the earth like, likewise was made supernaturally. It was made mature. The universe was made mature. So if people reject that and they say, no, the universe came about by natural processes, of course they're going to overestimate the age. And a lot, of the, a lot of the age indicators that people use are because of that very assumption. Did anybody have a question in this section? Don't want to leave you guys out. And then we'll do one more after that. Jonathan. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on, uh, on Genesis 1-3, um, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, and God saw the light was good. And here's the part. He separated the light from the darkness. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, uh, sometimes uh, in a chemical system or a scientific system, a separation creates a tension. Do you think that separating light from dark has anything to do with creation of time? With the creation of time? I, I, I don't think so. I think time was already there. Time is, God makes time at the beginning. Okay, so that's, time has a start and it'll go forever in the future. Well, at least in the new heavens and the new earth. But time has a beginning when God said, in the beginning, God created them in the earth. That's when time starts. Uh, the separation of the light from the darkness would indicate that the earth is illuminated on one side and dark on the other, as it is today. Apparently, when God first made the light, the earth was perhaps uniformly illuminated. And then he separates the day from the night, and he calls the light day, and the darkness he calls night. The earth's already rotating, so you have evening and morning. It's just for that first for those first few days, God was apparently providing the light, or maybe he had a temporary light source, whatever. But then on the fourth day, he replaces that temporary light source, whatever it is, with the sun to be a permanent light bearer. Thanks. Folks, this will be our last question, but uh, we will have a, a few moments in between the equipping hour and the worship service to talk to Dr. Lyle, and then certainly afterwards. Greg, you want to take that last question? You mentioned uh, carbon-14 testing. There's lots of other radiometric testing that happens that science uses. What about those? How, don't they corroborate the validity of carbon-14? Good question. The, the answer is they contradict C-14 dating. You get two different ages. We find, for example, wood buried in rock. You, you age date the rock using potassium argon, uranium lead. You get millions of years. You date the wood. It's got C-14 in it. It gets thousands of years. There are plenty of examples of that where they, they give conflicting ages. Now, the, the difference is carbon dating, 
I have a little more confidence. By the way, all, all age dating methods are based on certain assumptions, including carbon dating, um, like the, the idea that the rates are basically constant and so on. But with carbon dating, when we test it on things of known age, it tends to get the right answer. When we, when we test these other methods on things of known age, they tend to give the wrong answer. We've taken rocks from recent volcanoes, for example. We've had, when Mount St. Helens erupted, we, took some, we went and got some brand new rocks that just formed from the magma, and that's supposed to set the zero, it's supposed to set the clock to zero. We had them, we had them uh, dated, radiometrically dated using various methods. They came back with ages of hundreds of thousands of years on rocks that their actual age is zero, or you know, just a few years. Uh, so radiometric dating has been shown to not work on rocks of known age. It's assumed to work on rocks of unknown age, and I think that's not terribly uh, uh, persuasive. Uh, C14, on the other hand, it tends to give the right answer when we test it on things of known age. And by the way, if you're curious as to why radiometric dating gives ages that are inflated from the true ages, we've, we've done a whole research project on that. It's called the, the Rate Project, and you can read on this on our website. But there's more than one reason. Uh, one is we think that during the creation week and during the flood year, the rate at which radioactive decay happened was faster than it is today. There's very compelling evidence for that. They're very compelling. Well, folks, what a privilege it's been to have Dr. Lyle with us. Can we thank him? Thank I've asked Dr. Lyle to please close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your magnificent creation. And we thank you, Lord, that even though we've rebelled against you and we deserve death and ultimately a lake of fire, we, we thank you that you have graciously stepped in our place and, and become one of us and, and taken our place on the cross. And we ask that you would just bless the remainder of this day and help this information to, uh, to stick with people and help us to be good witnesses to you and be able to defend your faith effectively that we may see that we make disciples of all nations if you, as you have commanded us to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.